has your opinion of or perception of the Supreme Court changed recently? Definitely. I don't think it's representative of America at all currently. The court has appeared a lot more partisan with the recent decisions, especially with Dobbs and then also with uh, ethics scandals as well. I'm not that optimistic about the Supreme Court until we get some change in there. I do like the court reform measures uh, about having rotations, maybe adding judges. The Supreme Court is a bit of a farce in general. It's built on a lot of systemic problems, racism, misogyny, xenophobia, all that stuff. The past few years specifically, it's been showing what the Supreme Court can be at its worst. This particular court does not care at all about precedent, and it's just been a lot more blatant, pointing out a lot of things that have been there the whole time. It's Notes from America. I'm Kai Wright, and welcome to the show. It is coming up on that time of year, the end of a Supreme Court term, when the justices start dropping their biggest and most controversial and anxiety-provoking decisions. This year, the court still has dozens of rulings to deliver before the end of June, including big decisions on affirmative action, on President Biden's student loan relief, on congressional redistricting, on the Indian Child Welfare Act, and among others. This is just a sampling. And of course, there is a moment when this is rather a moment when many, many people feel like the court has just become uniquely partisan and like the justices have become uniquely unaccountable. See under Clarence Thomas and his undisclosed gifts from the wealthy Republican donor Harlan Crow. So we're going to start this week by talking about talking with a court watcher who is admittedly one of its most vociferous critics, uh, Ellie Mistal. He is the author of Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution and Justice Correspondent for The Nation magazine. And Ellie, welcome back to Notes from America. Hi, Kai. Uh, nice. Thanks to you for having me um, at the beginning of the worst month of my life annually. <laughs> we figured we'd get as you on the, the Friday. Supreme Court starts to release its horrible decisions. Well, let us do begin with Clarence Thomas. Uh, you had what I found to be an interesting take on the news about his relationship with Harlan Crow. And just in case there are listeners who don't follow this stuff, let me recap. Last month, ProPublica published an investigation into court ethics that found Thomas has, for years, been accepting gifts of luxury travel and fine art and the like without disclosing those gifts. And Harlan Crow is, of course, not just any rich friend. He's a major Republican donor and funder of conservative causes that have been before Thomas on the court. So, Ellie, you wrote in The Nation that those of us who are worried about these gifts should not think about them as buying Thomas's votes, uh, but rather buying influence over his written opinions. Explain that. Yes. Yeah, so it's really buying Thomas's time is what's happening, right? Supreme Court opinions are very long, they're very complicated, and they contain lots of phrases and words that can shape the law or change the law going forward beyond the actual 546390 vote of the opinion. Mm -hmm. Clarence Thomas is a crazy man. There, there is a level of things that he is going to do that he would happily do for free. He would happily eat people's rights for free. He will happily turn um, overturn affirmative action this summer for free. You don't have to buy his vote on some of these hot button issues. What you want to buy is his time. What you want to buy is his writing. What you want to buy is that little phrase here or there that can set up or, or, or uh, a, a legal change down the road or reinforce um, a change that he was kind of already set to make, right? right. Um, one important way of looking at the Harlan Crow gifts and the trips to Indonesia and the yachts and, and the whatever is that these people, Harlan Crow and his rich Republican buddies, got the opportunity to lobby Clarence Thomas to his face for hours and hours and hours over years and years and years, right? Think about what I would have to do to get that kind of time, right? What, as, yep. as a non-rich, non-Republican donor, what would I have to do to get an hour of Clarence Thomas's time 
to try to convince him of my point of view. Well, I have to file a case, right? Have that case get appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court, be admitted to the Supreme Court bar, and then maybe if I was lucky, I would get half an hour to plead my case to Clarence Thomas. But if I was a friend of Harlan Crow's, all I have to do is show up for Memorial Day weekend. Man. And all of a sudden, I get my hour, I get my two hours to, to, to make my case directly to that man. That's where the corruption lies. And it's not just buying votes. It's buying that, that ability to either influence an opinion or to harden his heart on a particular ruling that he was already likely to make. And let's just dig in a little bit uh, specifically about like how these opinions matter and how this process unfolds, um, how like that that one little sentence here or there changes things down the road. Uh, you offer the example of gun laws in your piece. Um, and um, so this is in your essay in the nation and you draw a line from the court's 2008, I believe, ruling that the Constitution grants a personal right to bear arms back to a 1997 opinion in which Thomas introduces this idea, which was novel and kind of fringe at the time. So unpack that for, for, for us non-lawyers slowly uh, about how that, why, what he did in 97 and how it led to 2008. Exactly. For, for people who, who haven't been following the development of the National Rifle Association, right? The, the idea that the Second Amendment uh, protects the right to bear arms so that you can kill somebody else who is bothering you, right? That, that is a new NRA ad campaign that they launched in the late 60s and early 70s, right? That's not how America worked for the first 200 years of the Second Amendment, right? The NRA launches this ad campaign in the 70s, and for 20 years, it is disregarded by serious people, including everybody on the Supreme Court. But Clarence Thomas comes along. Clarence Thomas gets pushed, pushed up to the Supreme Court. Antonin Scalia gets pushed up to the Supreme Court. And they buy the NRA marketing campaign that for the first time in American history, the Second Amendment doesn't protect the rights to bear arms for a well-regulated militia, the blah, blah, blah. No, 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 it suddenly now protects a right to bear arms for personal self-defense, um, as the NRA ad campaign said in the 70s. The first person to put that into writing at the Supreme Court level is Clarence Thomas in this case in 1997, where he opines, where he adds in, where he's, they're already making a decision to, uh, uh, knock down a gun law, right? Again, Clarence Thomas's vote, he's a crazy man, right? But in this ruling where they're knocking down a gun law, Clarence Thomas introduces this poison, which is the idea that the, that the Second Amendment protects a personal right to bear arms for self-defense. That poison then gets repeated by law by federal society law well, professors. That's right. and, so why does that matter that 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 Clarence Thomas wrote that sentence in his in his concurring opinion or whatever? Like that's one justice. Why does why did that matter? Because now now you fast forward to two thousand and eight in D.C. versus Heller, when Antonin Scalia is officially inventing this right to bear arms for personal self-defense, it doesn't look so crazy now because he's got precedent to rely upon, right? So Scalia then, it's, you have to understand the kind of uh, circular logic of Republicans especially, right? They, they, they now are able to refer to themselves in the past as saying, oh, it's actually established Supreme Court president for 10 years that there's a personal right to bear. We're not just making it up now. This has been a precedent for 10 years at the Supreme Court level, which it technically has been because of this line from the Clarence Thomas opinion in 1997, right? Like that's, and again, not just the Supreme Court precedent, but then you put it into a Supreme Court case, then you get law, then you get professors, law professors working on it, um, federal society, law professors, especially writing law review articles saying, oh yes, it's totally normal to have a right to bear arms and to shoot And they're people. talking I mean, about that's... a Supreme Court word. They're talking about words that were written in the Supreme Court right. opinion. So it's not just some fringe journal. So article. it's not just fringe crazy people. That's how they normalize Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas has not had a lot of majority opinions, you know, given how long he's been on the court and that kind of stuff. But what he's been extremely effective at is incepting these ideas and kind of shifting the conversation, shifting the Overton window. When Clarence Thomas shows, showed up on the court, he was understood to be a fringe extremist. Scalia actually at one point in an interview 
um, with the New Yorker, I think in the in the late '90s, actually said or early 2000s, says something to the effect of, "You know, I'm an originalist. I'm not a nut like Clarence. Like that's Scalia talking, <laughs> right?" So Clarence Thomas was well understood to be kind of a fringe actor in the late '90s and early 2000s, but over time, his fringiness is now mainstream conservative intellectual thought. And that's where you start to ask, what has Harlan Crow been paying for mm. for the past 30 years? What have all of Harlan Crow's friends been paying for for the past three years? Remember, Kai, these people were not friends before Clarence Thomas was on the Supreme Court. This is an important point that gets lost in the conversation, too. It's not like they're like old buddies from college. Right? This was, these are not college buddies. This these is post-court hanging out this with is billionaires two or three years after clarence thomas is already ensconced in the supreme court that suddenly harlan crow wants to be his friend suddenly harlan crow wants to take him off to, out to trips suddenly harlan crow wants to and i am not making this up pay tuition for the secret son that he adopted like that's that's i got really good college buddies right <laughs> i don't, I don't got a single one of them who is going to pay tuition for my kids. All right, but if we're being real, how many billionaires do you know, Ellie? I mean, come on. I mean, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't nice to those guys in college. That's that's, that's on me. <laughs> and so here you are now with nobody to pay for your kids' college tuition but yourself. Uh, listeners, we've got open phones this week. If you've got a question about the Supreme Court or any case before it pending this term, call us up. Let's see if Ellie's got an answer for you. 844-745-TALK. That's 844-745-8255. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can just drop it in the chat as well. This is any question about the court, about Clarence Thomas and his uh, undisclosed uh, gifts, if you will. Uh, or any question about a particular any case. case. Damn, Kai, any case, damn. Any case, any case, Elliot. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna test. see if we can stump you. Eight four four seven four five talk. That's eight four four seven four five eight two five five. We'll take a break. I'm talking with Ellie Mistal, author of Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution and Justice, Cor and Justice Correspondent for The Nation magazine about this the end of this Supreme Court term and uh, all of the questions that surround it. 844-745-TALK. That's 844-745-8255. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It's Notes from America. I'm Kai Wright, and I'm talking with Ellie Mistal, Justice Correspondent for the Nation and author of Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. 
We've been talking about Clarence Thomas, and I'm going to revisit the good Justice Thomas and his ideological journey a little later in the show. Uh, but Ellie, your book's now out in paperback, and you've updated it because this court does stay busy. Uh, <laughs> you, you added a chapter on Dobbs. Let's let's start there talking about what we're facing right now. There There is new stuff before the court right now uh, uh, dealing with reproductive rights. Right, and I just I just added a, a thing on Dobbs to really explain how Dobbs is the culmination of a generations long um, federal society project to again I was talking about poison before with Clarence Thomas to inject the poison of originalism into our public discourse. It was all so they could do a decision like Dobbs. Otherwise, you know, without originalism, without this kind of um, fake way of interpreting the Constitution that conservatives invented. The Dobbs decision would be impossible hmm. because Roe v. Wade was settled law resting on 50 years of settled precedent with no kind of significant change in the circumstances of, you know, women's reproductive rights and how they work um, uh, that would uh, require updating that precedent from Roe. So they invent this thing, they call it originalism, as a way to undo the civil and social rights gains of the 20th century and reset the law back to circa 1850. And that, obviously, we see it with uh, women's reproductive rights. Obviously, we're seeing it now with uh, some of these decisions regarding the abortion pill uh, coming out of the Fifth Circuit. And we're about to see it heavily uh, this month as the Supreme Court gets into the, to the controversial part of its term, where they're going to undo a bunch of other things that have also uh, rested on, on, on very long precedent. I think uh, uh, first in their firing chamber uh, this term is going to be um, affirmative action which is another 50 year long uh, uh, social policy. I would argue uh, affirmative action has actually been the single most um, successful um, uh, 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 racial justice policy uh, since, eman since emancipation. Yeah. And, wow. uh, and if you just think about what affirmative action has actually done, right? We don't have a black president without affirmative action. We don't have the sense of racial comedy that we have now without affirmative action because the key thing that affirmative action does is that it it continue it finishes the work of brown v board of ed by forcing people to be educated together and what we see is that when you're educated together uh, at, at, at elite institutions at many colleges and universities right and what we see is that when people have to learn together when people have to live together in college they tend to not hate each other as much they tend to realize, oh, you're more like, you know, like one of my best friend from college is, 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 for, is a white guy from Maine that without affirmative action, I never would have met. And by the way, when I say affirmative action, I'm not talking about like, that's how I got in. I had the good scores. I'm talking <laughs> sure. about. I'm sure I was in affirmative action. Let, let me ask you this. You know, I'm talking about like my white friend from Maine probably doesn't get into, I went to Harvard, probably doesn't get into Harvard without a little bit of like, well, you know, we don't have a lot of kids from Maine in this yeah, class. We yeah. got to, people don't realize that the geographic sort is uh, one of the most important aspects of building out a college class. So yeah, so these are really successful social policies and the Supreme Court is going to undo uh, do them all. So the, case, uh, the, the affirmative case, the affirmative action case before the court this year, it could indeed be decisive. It It, it is uh, a question of whether or not race can be considered in uh in college admissions for the purpose of achieving diversity and mm -hmm. so i i take it from your from what you've just said you expect in fact they're going to say nope it can't and that's the end that's going down six three and clarence thomas I, I i i joked a couple of years ago that clarence thomas won't die until he gets to be the black person who ends affirmative action. That's like literally keeping him alive. Um, he, he hates the policy so much. He hates it, and you'll talk about this with your next guest, but he hates it in part because people were super mean to him at Yale. When he went to Yale, people were like, really like, you're affirmative action at me. And he was like, no, I'm not. Stop saying that, Chad. And then like his reaction to that, instead of being like, screw Chad, I'm gonna go on, was just like, I will end affirmative action and then nobody will be able to say, and that's what he's going to do. It is particularly galling in this case because the case is about whether or not Harvard and University of North Carolina were discriminating against Asian American students, AAPI students, um, uh, by admitting African American students. And, and just 
No, they weren't. But when I say no, I don't mean just like my feeling is no. I mean, the record is literally in the in the University of, of North Carolina case, the record shows that AAPI students have a better chance to get into UNC than African-American students or Latino students or any of these people uh, uh, that they're claiming benefited from affirmative action. So the idea that affirmative action is somehow hurting AAPI students is just kind of bollocks on its face. In the Harvard case, it's really annoying to me because they did find something that you could argue was discriminating against AAPI students. Harvard uses a particular factor. It's called a personality rating that's kind of based on rec letters and, and, and guidance counselor stuff. And AAPI students were scoring significantly lower on that scale, which is bollocks, which is probably racist. It's probably racist high school uh, guidance counselor saying like, I don't think Jim is a very nice person. Yeah, he's good at math, but what, like, that's, that's the thing that's hurting AAPI students at Harvard, not affirmative action, not admitting African-American and Latino students. But after the Supreme Court decision this June, the racist thing that Harvard does, they're going to still be allowed to do. But affirmative action, action will not which continue. isn't hurting AAPI students, is going to be the thing that's unconstitutional. All right, I'm going to work through some of the questions we're getting. Uh, so, and, uh, you know, some of these are going to be legally. Uh, and I want you to be as, as succinct as you can so we can get to as many as we can. So there's some, somebody on YouTube asks, uh, I'd like you to like I'd like a comment about Thomas's opinion on Stafford Un Unified School District versus Redding. Uh, he argued that the school was correct in strip searching a student accused of having ibuprofen. Are you familiar with the case? Uh, vaguely, I know that Thomas generally as his thing, he he's he's a, he's pro authoritarian. So at, at any point where the power basically Thomas only believes the state can do two things. Fight crime and terrorism. Right, let, let the, the state is has ultimate power to do that, and harass people. Like if the, the state is doing some kind of fundamental invasive harassment, of fundamentally um, invading a person's privacy or whatever, Thomas is also oh, cool with the state doing that. So that's kind of how you explain right. that decision. Everything else, the state's not allowed, like deal with the environment. No, no, no. How state can the power. state pop? Right, but like rubber glove a high school student. Yeah, the state can do that according to Clarence Thomas. Let's go to Jason in Chicago, who I think uh, wants to disagree with you. Jason, welcome to the show. Yeah, I appreciate you for uh, letting me get on air here with you. So my, my question and my comment, I guess, are a little bit of both, would be that couldn't the same argument be made reference uh, uh, your guest uh, talking about Clarence Thomas changing the Second Amendment, um, as he claims, that somebody would own a gun just to shoot people? And in the reverse, couldn't I just say that for the um, – for Roe versus Wade and abortion, because for many years prior to 30 years ago, that was precedent that abortion was illegal. And then some Supreme Court justices changed that. So couldn't I use that same argument against him in that regard? Ellie? Well, here's your here, here's your thing, Jason. First of all, it wasn't 30 years ago, it was 50 years ago. And first, and second of all, it wasn't some Supreme Court justices, it was all the Supreme Court justices, right? So like that's number one, you've got a much deeper precedent for abortion rights in a row than you have for Thomas's interpretation of gun rights. But number two, and I think the bigger issue here is that I look at Roe v. Wade as correcting a fundamental flaw with the constitution itself. And that fundamental flaw was that no women were allowed to participate in the writing of the constitution. So Jason, if you're okay with no women being allowed to have a say in the government under which they live, that's one thing. But if you're not okay with that, one might argue, I would argue, let's put it like that, that doing something like acknowledging that women have a reproductive right to their own bodies, while yes, went against established precedent at the time that it was uh, 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 put down in 1973, which again was 50 years ago, not 30 years ago, but was done against the established precedent because the established precedent did not allow women to have a say in anything as opposed to what Scalia and Thomas and, and the other conservatives did in, to, in 2008 um, with Heller and changing the laws around gun rights, I would just point out that guns, while many people love them and, and, and pray to them and think that they're super important, they're not people, right? So, and, and so like changing the law around a not person thing, 
is something where you can really kind of go into the legalese and the history and is this right changing the law around whether or not we're going to acknowledge people as people who weren't treated as people when the document was written i think is different in kind now to now to be to be fair for to jason jason did not say anything about his opinion about abortion or whether uh, sure, he, sure. He, it was the legal uh, strategy the, the legal logic does it not apply to the same and the point is no because there was it's a it's a question of of degree uh of precedent and substantively what we're talking about uh let's go to kathy in new york kathy welcome to the show hi thanks um it's a good show i just wondered and this is kind of a broad stroke question but in terms of types of cases or types of litigation um, has there been a notable acceleration of some types over others that the court will take? Like, like say if you had a bar chart of constitutional topics that the cases reflect, does one recent decade look significantly different from another? It's a great cast question, Kathy. Ellie? Yeah, so Kathy, the best way I can explain that is that uh, uh, the way a, court, a case becomes a Supreme Court case, 7,000 7, cases are appealed to the Supreme Court every year around that only a hundred or so are taken up, right? And so what uh, decides which hundred they're gonna take? Well, they have a vote, right? They have a vote on whether or not they wanna hear the case. And that vote does not require a majority of the court, that vote only requires four. And so the biggest change that's happened kind of in recent history in our uh, with the Supreme Court is really that change from Anthony Kennedy to Brett Kavanaugh because Brett Kavanaugh became the fourth vote, along with Thomas, who was already there, Alito, who was already there, Gorsuch, who replaced Merrick Garland, but really replaced Antonin Scalia, who was already there. But then Kavanaugh became the fourth vote, legal people like me, we call them the four horsemen, to hear the most kind of aggressive extremist Republican version of any case available, right? Now, they don't always rule with the most extremist Republican version of any case available, but they're always willing to hear it, right? They're always willing. And that's, Kathy, been the real big difference, you know, the last, you know, few years here, as opposed to what came before. You're getting kind of a constant barrage of the, you know, a, a, a great way of putting it is think about Dobbs itself, right? When Dobbs, uh, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was alive, Dobbs was already in the system, right? And what Mississippi the literal was already, case. the literal case, Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health, was already in the system, was already coming up for appeal. And the argument that Mississippi, the, the forced birthers were making, was that they should uphold Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban. They weren't going to overturn Roe v. Wade, but then Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And Amy Coney Barrett replaced her. And at that point, Mississippi changed its argument. It went from asking the Supreme Court to uphold the 15 week ban to asking the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade outright, which is what it did. So like that's the power of each individual justice. Once you get four, you can hear any wackadoodle version of the case. Once you get five, you can win any wackadoodle doodle version of the case. And once it gets six, you can lose one of them and still win any wackadoodle version of the case. Is, that's the difference. Speaking of individual justices, my question is, what has there been anything that's emerged thus far that gives us a sense of uh, Justice Kataji, Kataji Brown Jackson and her, what, influ what impact she will have on the court? Have we seen anything uh, that sort of gives a window into know, here, what kind of justice she's going to be? I, 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 I'm the first, first year, so you know, all of this is just tea leaf reading. Uh, based on her oral arguments, which are fantastic, I mean, if you... I'm, I'm a big fan of how she argues just in person at the court. She feels more like a Kagan person to me than a Sotomayor person to me. And by that, I mean, uh, from what I, again, it's really early. Well, from what I gather, KBJ is a rule follower. Uh, and just like Elena Kagan, like the, she, she likes a rule. <laughs> and she will, I believe, rule against herself if, if the rule is strong and good and based on on, on good reason, if she she wants she a logic the rule, to the law, right? If she thinks the rule was logical, even if she doesn't agree with the rule, she seems like the kind of person who's going to follow the rule as long as the rule was logical, right? As opposed to how, let's say, I would be if I was a Supreme Court justice, and I will note <laughs> that I am not, right? 
I mean, like, if the rule's stupid, don't bring it to my court, right? Like, I don't want to hear about your stupid rule. Like, is it, are, are we going towards fairness or away from fairness? And if we're going away from fair, put like this, um, if you think about this in a D&D term, I am neutral good. I'm not lawful good, right? Like, anything that gets us to the good place, All I'm right. willing to we're, do. We're at Dungeons and Dragons and I can't follow you, Ellie. I'm going to sneak in <laughs> one more one more call before we have to go to break. Let's go to Brett in Elgin, Illinois. <laughs> Brett, welcome to the show. Uh, hi there. Thanks for thanks for taking my call. Um, so I have uh, two questions. The the first one is Co collapse them as quick as you can from, for me, Brett. Certainly, certainly. If, if we're operating from the observation that there are bad faith actors on the court that are adjudicating based on ideology and not law and precedent, is there any sign that this administration might seek to expand the court? And if so, what's the metric for doing it? The second being pertaining to Justice uh, Thomas and his gifts. I think campaign finance reform is the way we're going to fix politics in general in this country. Are there any cases before the court or in the lower courts that uh, pertain to campaign finance? And can that somehow be used to correct the courts and the gifts that uh, justices get? I, Ellie, you got one minute. No you got one minute, Ellie, to answer this. No and no. The Biden administration is really uh, against court expansion, has not come out in favor of any significant uh, uh, method of court reform. Biden is not on board with doing anything. And basically his accolades in the Senate, Dick Durbin, Chris Coons, they're also not on board and actually using legislative powers to bring this court to heel. So that's number one. Number two, the campaign finance question. Great question. Citizens United. They've already decided that we can't do anything about campaign finance laws. And as long as there are six Republicans on the court, that's how it's always going to be. So that's just a dead end then on both things? I mean, is there, with your remaining 20 seconds, what can happen then uh, on more accountability for this court? I yell at Dick Durbin every time I get a chance. Like at some <laughs> point, Dick Durbin and Joe Biden have to abandon the old ways and embrace the idea that the court must be stopped and reformed. That's the only way forward. Okay, well, we will leave it at there, shouting at, at Senator Dick Durbin. Ellie Mistel is the justice correspondent for The Nation and author of Allow Me to Retort, A Black Man's Guide to the Constitution. Ellie, thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And coming up, we go a little deeper on Justice Clarence Thomas. How did he develop his particular ideology? And more than that, what does his journey tell us about the country overall? We'll be right back. Stay with us. Chief Justice and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. 
It's Notes from America. I'm Kai Wright. And some of you audio nerds will recognize that Oye Oye sound mix there from the opening theme of the Supreme Court, Supreme Court, excuse me, podcast, More Perfect. Our WNYC colleagues have just launched season four of that fantastic show, and I hope you'll check it out. Their most recent episode is a deep dive into the life and logic of Justice Clarence Thomas. And we found it so provocative that we decided to call up one of the scholars that More Perfect spoke with and get some follow-up questions into him. So I'm joined now by Corey Robin. He is a political scientist at Brooklyn College and the CUNY Graduate Center and author of the book, The Enigma of Clarence Thomas, which was published in 2019. And Corey, welcome back to Notes from America. Thanks for having me back. So uh, More Perfect kicks off their episode with a line from a speech Clarence Thomas gave, and I want to play that for listeners to get us started as well. It pains me deeply, or more deeply than any of you can imagine, to be perceived by so many members of my race as doing them harm. All the sacrifice, all the long hours of preparation were to help, not to hurt so one of the primary takeaways in studying Thomas that you you seem to have come to is that he's concluded that anti-Black racism is basically unsolvable. Um, and if that's the case, now what? <laughs> um, it seems to be his beginning point. So introduce us to that part of Clarence Thomas. Yeah, this is something people don't really know about him. But if you read both his opinions and uh, read his speeches uh, since he's been on the court, before he was on the court, when he was ascendant in the Republican Party, what always stands out about that is his belief that racism is intractable, that racism is not going away, that this country has the stain of white supremacy and white supremacy is not going away. Now, that's not a, necessarily a, a strange opinion. It's, mm -hmm. it's a fairly common opinion. What is strange is that Clarence Thomas is, of course, a, a very hard right conservative. And one of the reasons I called my book The Enigma of Clarence Thomas was how do we put those two things together? In a nutshell, I would say that Thomas believes that race really affects things that the government does, that the state does. Uh, and in this, he draws from a long tradition of Black nationalism, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey. So things like voting, things like affirmative action, all the things that the state does in order to improve the condition of Black Americans, Thomas sees as a kind of poison pill that will debilitate Black Americans ultimately. On the flip side, um, uh, he has this belief that there are places and niches of the economy, of a capitalist market economy, where Black people can thrive, particularly Black men like his grandfather, uh, and that the fate of Black people as a people in America depends upon propping up and cultivating these very powerful Black men. He has said explicitly that the fate of Black America depends upon the fate of Black men. So it's a very patriarchal vision. It's a very masculine vision. And it's one in which uh, it, it, that a lot where Black men in, in, in economic institutions um, can essentially provide the salvation for Black people yeah. as a whole. And, and I mean, so this is the, the foundation of his Black nationalism. I, are you familiar, Corey, with the term HOTEP? Yes, I, I learned this in the course of writing my book, yes. <laughs> because um, it, this, I, for me, on some level, this is not that complicated. I've met this man throughout much of my life, uh, the, the pro-Black person who is actually just pro-Black men, not pro-Black gay people, yeah. not pro-Black women, not pro-Black poor people, just Black men. Uh, yeah. seems to be that is what that is what we call hotep uh, for for those who are not in on it um but i mean at what point um well let me put it this way when, when in his sort of ideological journey um yeah. did this his roots in black nationalism he's as a youth he's reading malcolm x like many of us he's taking these patriarchal ideas up about it uh but he's reading those parts of it how, when and how did that start to show up as a legal framework? Well, not really until the 1980s. Um, you know, Thomas, 
gets his, as you say, he has his roots in this black, he starts out off on, on the left uh, um, as a campus activist and radical. He starts making this journey to the right during the 1970s, but he's prim primarily a political activist and a political actor. He joins the Reagan administration, but he has his heart set and his eyes set on the Supreme Court, but he doesn't have a jurisprudence at all. He's, you know, it, it, the more charitable reading of him is he's, he's like an older kind of uh, Supreme Court figure, people like Earl Warren and Hugo Black. They were not legal scholars. They did not have, um, you know, they they, they 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 didn't serve in the Justice Department or things like that. They Big were political liberal actors. heroes on the Supreme Court. We should say for people. Correct. Who don't I mean, know. we've so gotten used to the idea that everybody on the Supreme Court went to Harvard and Yale and is probably a law professor. Thomas is really an outlier in that regard, but he is part of an older tradition. Um, but he, as he gets closer and closer to the court, uh, he first gets appointed to the Washington, D.C. Circuit of Appeals by George H.W. Bush. He begins to develop this jurisprudence, and he gets a lot of help from uh, conservative legal activists like that, that Ellie Mistah was talking about earlier, people in the, you know, what becomes the Federalist Society. And what's fascinating about him is that he, the way he manages to marry this, you know, conservative black nationalism, hotep nationalism, whatever you want to call it, um, to a legal vision, to uh, a constitutional vision. And it just starts unfolding pretty much from the moment that he gets on the court. And, you know, you wrote in a, just to talk about like exactly how that unfolds and what it means for, for his jurisprudence in a New Yorker piece uh, about a year ago, you wrote uh, to try to explain how he came to be so opposed uh, to unenumerated rights, what, what they're called unenumerated rights. So, you know, um, abortion rights, same-sex rights, and things like that uh, being read into the Constitution by liberals. Um, and that that very much connected to his Black nationalists, his ideas yeah. of Black nationalism. Explain the connection between these two things. Okay, this this gets a little bit wonky, so I apologize. <laughs> as best as you can. But I think it's an uh, important understanding of where he's coming from. Yeah, so Thomas, uh, the Fourteenth Amendment is we we mostly know the Fourteenth Amendment because of the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause. These are the foundations of both, uh, you know, right civil rights and individual rights. And as you said, the way that happens is people read the Due Process Clause um, in a substantive way, saying that it guarantees certain fundamental rights. Um, Ellie was talking about reproductive rights earlier, uh, and the idea being that the state can't take those rights away from you unless it has a really damn good reason to do it. So foundational are they to individual liberty and freedom. There is, however, a third clause in the 14th Amendment that nobody has ever heard of called the Privileges or Immunities Clause. This was originally supposed to be the palladium for, for people involved in Reconstruction, um, for people who were you know, involved in the emancipation of Black America, this was supposed to be the foundation for Black freedom, right. the privileges or immunity clause, because the idea was that all the things that we think of as fundamental rights and freedoms, uh, freedoms and rights and of, of the individual and of the citizen, all are guaranteed by the federal government against the state. Now, that um, privileges or immunities clause was gutted pretty much right away um, after, you know, after affirmative action. But Thomas has, from a very long time ago, actually, even going back before he joined the court, has had what some people have called an African-American reading of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Uh, and that's where he sees the foundation um, for Black freedom. Now, you might say, so what kind of freedoms are we talking about? And here we get to the more conservative aspects of it. So the fundamental freedom that he thinks is protected by that Privileges or Immunities Clause is the right to bear arms. And, you know, I think for many of us, we'd say, aha, so this is all BS. It's just, you know, a kind of a mm -hmm. fancy way of dressing things up. And there's truth to that. If, however, you read his opinions on the right to bear arms, they are laced and steeped in a reading of the violence of abolition, emancipation, and reconstruction. That essentially, and we go back to that Black man, that the only thing that Black people can count on is that firm black father. And he ends one of, Thomas oh, ends God. one of his cases with this vision, that firm, you know, strong black man standing in the doorway, facing down a white supremacist terrorist mob with his gun. And that is the fate 
of, of black people. So you, you can see right there how he has this alternative reading of, and not really an alternative reading, he's actually quite right about the violence of the 19th right. century and so forth. <laughs> Um, but 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 uh, uh, married to a very truncated vision where you have black men, you know, with guns protecting themselves and their communities and their families against the white mob. And it's a it's a it's a strange um, not it's not a strange vision. It's just strange to know that Clarence Thomas, this hero of Harlan Crow and Donald Trump and, and all these other people has been not so secretly, I mean, these are not tucked away in archives, they are right there in his opinions, has been teaching this line about um, the fate of black people and who and whom they can and cannot depend upon. Well, but I mean, it's consistent ideologically with some of the people you just named, because again, it's about a strong yeah. man at the center of yes. society. Um, so that is quite consistent, um, yes. using violence to, uh, to, to create order. Yeah. Um, but then what does that have to do with my rights, uh, a, as a gay man, right? Like what is, yeah. so what is, what is the, the, is, all of that can be true and have nothing to do with like, okay, well, we can still have abortion rights. We can still have same sex yeah. marriage. We can still, why are those things mutually exclusive in Clarence Thomas's ideological vision? So Thomas gave a really interesting speech. I think it was 93 or 94, two years after he had joined the court, where he critiqued what we um, in, in the, uh, what legal scholars call the rights revolution uh, of the 20th century, that liberals, you know, first with the New Deal, championing economic rights, uh, second with the Warren Court, um, championing um, the sort of due process rights of criminals and people who have been accused right against a carceral state. And then third, um, with uh, the sexual revolution, um, that those are the big liberal freedoms that were won in the 20th century. And what Thomas says about those three things is that all of them had a very negative impact, he claims, for this kind of black man, this black male patriarch. Um, that, and, and he has gone so far, by the way, to say this, both before and after joining the court, that you know, the thing about Jim Crow as terroristic and um, and, and, and sort of uh, a totalitarian, he's even used the term, as it was, is that it, uh, it um, calls forth for this almost superhuman strength from these Black individuals who overcame uh, their circumstances. And what the rights revolution did was to sap their will, their discipline, um, that kind of iron strength that he saw in his grandfather, producing somebody like his father who left, abandoned the family when he was something like two or three years old. So that's a long way of you know, answering your question, say, what about um, people who are gay? What about you know, abortion rights? He sees the, all of that, th those liberties as a kind of making life easier, make opening the whole idea that we have of opening up avenues so people can move forward, Thomas thinks is destructive um, of, of, of Black men in particular and with them of the Black community, that it's under very, very hard conditions, very, very difficult and adverse conditions that you will get the sort of rise of these, you know, superhuman kinds of figures right. upon whom the Black people have depended for hundreds of years. Now, having said all this, reading and listening to you, uh, a, a lot of it feels like the, the, the point is that this is all kind of beside the point at the, at, at now, nowadays with Clarence Thomas. I mean, uh, we spoke earlier uh, about the scandal surrounding his undisclosed gifts from Harlan Crow. Yeah. Um, and after that story uh, uh, broke, you wrote in Politico, uh, and I'm going to quote you because it's a, it's a useful turn of phrase, Money hasn't paved the way to Thomas's positions. On the contrary, Thomas's positions have paved the way for money. Uh, so what did you mean by that? And what does that have to do with any of this black nationalism? So um, if you'll allow me to tell a, a quick story or not, not so quick, uh, in 1987, Thomas gives a speech to a libertarian think tank uh, out in San Francisco. And he says, the problem with uh, 20th century liberals is that they have contempt for um, people who make money, people like my grandfather, he says, people who earn, you know, 
built small businesses um, and uh, were able to put me and my brother through private school and college and all the rest of it. And liberals have contempt for that vision of, of money. Um, instead, liberals like um, what he calls uh, the people in the speech professions, lawyers, journalists like yourself, <laughs> um, lawyers like Ellie, um, pro professors like myself, right? People who are, uh, he calls into the idealistic professions. And he says, and he, he maps this all out. It's actually kind of fascinating. Um, it's all there. We, the reason, you know, and, and, and they find a privilege for that, those kind of people who privilege speech in the First Amendment. What we need to do for the, on the right is to find a way of turning money uh, into a kind of spe uh, into speech. Um, so that it will have the same kind of First Amendment protections and, and uh, against the government regulation that other kinds of speech have. Um, and Thomas has pursued this line, you know, long before Citizens United, mm. long, you know, as soon as he came on the accord of money being speech, and even more than that, saying that if money is speech, it stands to reason that wealthy people are going to have more access and be able to uh, direct more of the political process. And it's by virtue appropriate of... because it's speech and that's what that is. Exactly. And again, you know, Thomas, you know, he has a reputation and rightly so of being a little bit, um, you know, paying, playing fast and loose and crooked and all the rest of it. But what I find so sort of shocking about him is actually how often he's so bracing and honest mm -hmm. about what he's actually doing. And so you go back to all these opinions in the 90s and you think, well, how could we have not known about Harlan Crow? He was providing a roadmap for everybody to see um, of what was going on. And I think this is part of, you know, the what's been so, I think, the, I, I wouldn't say it's a tragedy, but, you know, he was dismissed throughout the 90s and the aughts as just being, you know, the silent, you know, the guy who never asked questions, the, you know, he was thought to be stupid, Scalia's puppet, all these things. Well, we're now seeing, while people were saying all of that, he was mapping out this whole terrain um, that we are now, as you say, living with, and it almost feels beside the point, how, you know, in terms of him, how we got there. We got to leave it there. Corey Robin is a political scientist at Brooklyn College and author of the book, The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. Thanks for coming back, Corey. And you can hear more about Justice Thomas's interesting political journey by checking out the new season of More Perfect from our colleagues in WNYC studios, wherever you get your podcast, check it out. And follow Notes of Amer Notes from America wherever you get your podcast as well, or find us on Instagram at Notes with Kai. I'm Kai Wright. Thanks for spending this time with us, and I'll talk to you next week. <laughs>